Welcome to Oaken Bros. This is Eric. And I'm Michael, and we have a very special guest today. I'm going to pronounce his name because my brother was botching this before yeah, the intro. Sure. <laughs> Jeffrey Menaged, right? Okay. Perfect. Welcome, Jeffrey. Yes. <laughs> Perfect, Michael. Excellent. Welcome. I, I, we appreciate you coming here. You say and, it better than my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to say, is, is it, do you prefer Jeff or Jeffrey? Yeah, either one's fine. Most people call me Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Okay. And I like, yeah, I, I like what you said about the four letter word. That was, you know, I was trying to lead you into that. <laughs> you know, um, you could call me Jeff, you know, it's one of the, one of the four letter words that I don't mind being called. I love that. You can call me Mike. It's one of the four letter words. Yeah. I don't mind being called. I love you it. Can call, you can call me Eric. Yeah. So the, that the works. Four letter words that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're the first, like you're the first real mega private jet company that we've had on this show. And I want to thank you for joining us. And um, so where are you based? Where are you like right now? Right now, I am working out of a home office in New Jersey on the beautiful Jersey shore. Very nice. Okay. Yeah, Very I have, nice. um, for years, we had an office in, in Midtown Manhattan. And um, over the years, as our business has changed, it hasn't really served us that well. So we, um, we, we I have an office in Long Island. I can a half for me to get there from where I live. So I where probably- on the, Where on the island? It's at the airport in Farmingdale, Republic Airport. So you're, oh, by, yeah. you're by Talon? Yeah, it's actually yeah. the next, it's right down the road. It's the next building yeah. over. It's a company called Northeastern Aviation. Sure. And we, we have a big partnership deal with them where we co-manage a bunch of business jets. So I usually go like, you know, once once a week, twice a week, but you know, since the whole pandemic, I've been sort of working from home. We used to take off, when we were, I don't want to get too much into it, but we were, uh, we were chartering planes for quite some time. Um, well, I mean, we can get into why our father yeah. was our father was ill. Um, he had COPD, and it was just too hard to go through the airport. So we would tr we would fly less. So like that was when also our kids were a lot younger; they weren't in school yet, or just Michael's kid was just born. So this was twelve years ago, right now, mm -hmm. and um, we would fly private. And um, for, we would for go, ten years straight. Yeah, and yeah. and and we would go. We would fly out to Vegas, but we'd stay in Vegas for three months. And then we just fly home private. So now, obviously, we're we're not flying private, um, just because we were flying a lot more, at least pre-COVID. But um, you know, chances are that may start up again, at least in the beginning of when we start traveling well, again. Well, let me let me ask you a question: Have you seen a surge in your sales since COVID started back in like late February, early March? So for, April was really really dead. Like really? When say, yeah. When I say dead, I mean dead. The whole world, literally the whole planet was shut down. Right. And, you know, if someone was willing to travel, they really had nowhere to go. So right. what we found was that at these, you know, at the tail end of March, from the middle of March through the end of March, we had a lot of people sort of moving one way to just get to a place where they were planning to quarantine. Mm. And then April, everything stopped. In May, we started to see uh, a little bit of a recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that in May, we were probably at somewhere around 50% of the traffic volume that we would have expected pre-COVID. That's not bad. That's we not bad at all. We would love to get to 50%. Yeah, no, owning we're, owning, a, owning a global like, car service, we would love to get to 50%. I mean, yeah. I mean, at, at June, we're, we're almost back to 100. That's amazing. And so, and it looks like July is going to, you know, continue that, that improvement. We expect business to continue to firm up. Because the, I believe that there's there's going to be ongoing health risks. You know, the, the only the only uh, drawback to flying private is the cost, right? Yeah. It, I mean, if it was the same price as a commercial airline, we'd run the airlines out of business. The only problem is, is that it's a very expensive endeavor. You need a plane, and there's not a lot of seats, and you know, fuel's expensive, and pilots are expensive, and insurance is expensive. So it, it it's an expensive undertaking. But you know, over the years, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this close to 20 years. And wow. there's a lot of people out there that have the financial resources to fly private, and most of them just don't can't see spending that amount of money to travel. Right. And so what we're finding is now with the the health risk, especially for people that are over the age of sixty or sixty five, you know, they're more worried about their health than they are about having a couple of extra dollars in the bank. And so we've seen a lot of new customers coming into the market, but we haven't really seen our traditional customers start to travel as much yet. It's been mostly driven by new entrants into the marketplace. And that's in the charter area. And there's a natural progression where, you know, obviously you start chartering and then eventually if you charter enough, 
you realize that maybe you're better off with some other type of way of purchasing the service. And so you start looking at check cards and fractional purchases and whole aircraft acquisitions. Usually the, the natural entry point is charter. And the more you charter, eventually, you know, look at it one day and say, oh, man, you know, I spent $350,000 this year flying private. Right. You know, maybe there's a better way to do this. And that, that's sort of where the, you know, the, these other ways of traveling sort of get their, get their customer bases. Like a, you know, you, moving your way up the chain. You mentioned that you've been doing this for 20 years. Let's do it, yeah. You're, you're clearly not 20 years old. Although you do <laughs> look young, I have to say. So what I'm was 23. It? You're, yeah, you're, well, you're 23, yeah. exactly. How did you get into how did yeah, you get like, well, into I want to know what your aviation. life was like. Uh, what was your yeah. life like before private aviation? I mean, there's kind of like everyone's life before private aviation. There's right. not many people that say, Oh yeah, I was born on a private plane. I mean our children, Eric and my children, can technically say that because we were chartering planes when they were babies. But right. like, you know, we we resorted back to commercial when our father mm -hmm. passed away. But like, who were you before private air? Like, what were you doing? And how did so, you get into how did you get into private air? So in the late nineties, um, in the first tech boom, uh, I started an internet company. At the time, I had been working in a family business in the apparel industry in New York. We used to import, manufacture women's apparel. And um, I didn't love the business. Uh, at the time, there was this thing called the digital divide. So, I mean, this is like, seems like prehistoric now. Mm -hmm. So it was this, this thing called the digital divide where they looked at household incomes in America. And if you had a household income of less than $60,000, chances are you did not have a home computer with a connection to the internet. And all of the experts were starting to predict that online retail was going to drive bricks and mortar retail out of business. So all the bricks and mortar retailers needed to get online and fast. And mm -hmm. so I used to sell apparel to budget priced retail chains. Okay. And all of these retailers were looking for an internet play because the second they would announce an internet play, the stock would get a huge bump. Mm -hmm. So we put together a program where we were going to like for a monthly subscription, we were going to give a customer a computer with a connection to the internet. It was like 30 bucks a month. And the way that we were going to market it was that we were going to get space in the retail stores, the kiosks where people could go and learn about the service and sign up. Mm -hmm. And let's say you walked into a, I mean, most of the companies were trying to do this with their out of business, but you know, let's just say you walked into a retail store and you signed up for our service, no matter what, when you logged on to the internet, because at the time it was dial up, your homepage would be that retailer's website. You couldn't change it. It would get embedded into your dialer. So we were giving retailers a way to sort of leverage their customer base and their brand onto the internet. And that part of it went great. You know, where we ran into trouble was that we uh, we needed to give someone that had a household income of forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, we had to basically give them a thousand dollar computer. And you know, if they didn't pay after a month, you know, what, what were we going to do? You know off their internet service, but they still had this, you know, eight hundred dollar computer that we had to sort of deal with. Mm -hmm. So that was really the big challenge that we faced. We ran into trouble with credit and it was subprime credit or second tier credit and we had all kinds of uh all this, kinds this of issues. is so this is like such a nineteen nineties business. Yeah, exactly. You so know, just, you yeah. know the, the funniest <laughs> I'll tell just one quick story about it because I know mm -hmm. we want to talk about planes, but the funniest story about it was that in the late nineties in his last State of the Union address President Clinton said that his dream was to see a computer in every home in America. So the next morning, I called the White House and I got the White House operator. I said, I'd like to talk to the president. And now, like, the line goes silent. She says, Excuse me, sir. I said, This is not a crank phone call. My name is Jeffrey Menagin. I'm from New York. This is a business inquiry. Right. I need to talk to the president of the United States. She goes, Well, what do you need? I said last night in his State of the Union address, he said that his dream was to see a computer in every home in America. My job is to put a computer in every home in America. And I'm having some trouble, and I think he could help me out, and I want to talk to him about it. You know, like he said, this is his dream. I wanted to see if he's serious or if he's full of shit. So the, the operator started giggling. She says, well, you know, I can't really talk about my boss, but let me see if I could find someone else here that can help you. And so I got bounced around and ended up speaking to the uh, director of the president's office for business outreach. Wow. Told him what I wanted, went to the White House for a meeting, not with the president, obviously, but I went to the White House for a meeting. We wow. submitted a proposal. They told me that they gave it to the president's head of the National Economic Council. 
to review it because what we wanted to do is we wanted the government to guarantee credit, right? So if you're if you if you have a low income and you want to buy a house, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are government funded places where you could go for a mortgage. Right. So if a computer is so important, we wanted the government to just guarantee bed that is a backstop for the banks to do the financing, and it, they love the idea. And um, we were headed into an election cycle, and they had told me that they passed it along to someone from the uh, Al Gore team. And of course, Al Gore didn't win the election. Right. And we started. No, no, from no, 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 no. He he did. He did okay. win, but he didn't. <laughs> he wasn't crowned. <laughs> he didn't. Right? He won the election, but, but he didn't get the office. But he didn't get I, the office. I just have to say, go, going back to that cold call, so to speak, that yeah. that's that's amazing because, like, you know, yeah, just I was going there too, Eric. You, 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 like, like, just call, just do. Right. And so, like, like that, what's that, the that's power like, that's of a, the ultimate? That's the ultimate cold call. Right, yeah. you know, calling like, the president you know, of the United States. I getting... Pick up the phone. Like, what's the worst thing that happens? They don't answer. I right. got to tell you something, Jeff. I spent 20 years of my life cold calling. No joke, cold yeah. calling. When I was upcoming in the ranks of BLS and and promoting my parents' business and and trying to get us, you know, we we opened an office in Vegas and I called every hotel. You can't believe the power of a cold call if you know how to do it. If you if you get on saying hello, I want to sell you something in this set, but if you get on and being like. How's the weather? What's going on? And, and and you make it where it's just not about the sale. Like you said, I, you 100%. give people when you give people more in use value than you take from them. Yeah, that's when the sale happens. And what? and like when you get on saying, yeah, it's just it's like calling Microsoft. There's a guy full of crap or what? Yeah, let's I, see. Yeah, it's a, that's Bill amazing. Gates? Yeah. Promise the president, put your money where your mouth is. Listen, I've gotten into presidents of hotels. I've spoken to. You know, presidents of studios just by cold calling and saying, "Hey, listen, my name is Michael. I own a family business. I'd love to chat with you guys." Right. You know, and like, and people are open to it. If you're getting on like like a telemarketer, which is a, a much different thing, then like your 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 ratio of success is practically zero. But I commend you so much for cold calling <laughs> the president. That Thank is you. fucking amazing. Yeah, you know, you know the, the, I'm, uh, making, I'm making that. Story. I'm making that clip, and it's going to say cold. <laughs> Cold call the president. Call the White House. Yeah, oh, cold call the, the White House. For years, yeah. I cold call the White House. I love that. It's, 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 it's that's incredible. So what's the funniest cold call you ever made, Michael? Because I know. Oh my, my god! That's a great. Thirty seconds, but it was great. That's a great question. And you want to know what the, the craziest cold call of my life? This is a real quick story. Yeah. Um, I'm a writer. I don't know. You can't see it, but this is my this is one of my books, Monsterland. I'm a published right. author, and I cold call. It was actually a cold email. Okay. It wasn't really a cold call, but I cold emailed somebody and this was so, this was nuts. Um, uh, I, I, I was, I self-published all of my books and r real quick story. Uh, my mom was running my Facebook page. I don't really do social media except for LinkedIn. So my mom was running my Facebook page. I became this internet sensation, this indie writer who was writing novels. And I just, it was my, it was my spare time. And I got an email one Saturday, uh, on Facebook, a post or whatever, that an agent wanted to represent me in London. Huh. And I said, that's fantastic. It's great. And so he's like, I spoke to him. He was a lovely man. And he's like, I want to represent you. I'm, I'm hooked up in Hollywood. I could get your books all over. I said, great, fantastic. He says, um, I'm going to send you a contract. I said, great. So he sends me a contract. I don't know how to read a contract. Like, you know, I'm a limo guy, you know, like <laughs> we're in transportation here. So so I, he, it was an entertainment contract and my in-house attorney didn't know how to read that. So I had to find an entertainment attorney. So I, I went online. Uh, well, so a few months before that happened, I was reading a book called How to Sell Your Screenplay in Hollywood. And in this book, there was an entertainment attorney in there named Susan Grode. And um, she, uh, she, she was talking about, you know, how to break into Hollywood. And this book was written back in like 1986. Um, so I said, you know, that was the only entertainment attorney that I've ever read about. So I'll find her online. Hopefully she's alive and you know, you know I'll write her. Right. So I find her, I Google her, and uh, I saw her and I emailed her. Hi, Miss Grove. My name is Michael Oaken. My family and I own BLS, a global car service. Uh, I'm a writer in my spare time. And um, I published, uh, it was like 18, 15 books or something, and they're all bestsellers. And a guy wants to represent me, and I don't know what to do. So I really hope you can um, you know, reach out. You know, hopefully we can talk. And I hit send. Through, um, not a minute later, like I was gonna say, like three minutes later, it was like a minute later, thirty seconds later, my fucking cell phone rings, <laughs> and she's like, "Michael," I'm like, "Yes," she's like, "This is Susan Grode," and I'm like, "Hi, Mrs. Grode, how are you?" She goes, 
I've been a client of your limousine service for 30 years. I'm like, oh my That's God. I'm like, I didn't, I, I didn't use the company to call you, Miss Grode. You know, I found you online. I was reading your name in a book. I had no idea who you were. And she goes, you made the right cold call. She goes, I'm going to introduce him. And, and the story went where yeah. I now have a manager who is a, it was a, a crazy um, – he, he was an agent at art, creative artist agency, and this man put together every crazy movie in the 90s and early 2000s. Oh. And he's representing me now, and I got published because of her. And she all, has such because, big things yeah, because I wrote all, this woman. It, it's all because of a cold call. And just like I just want to say my cold calling story. When I first started at BLS, Michael's like, you got a cold call. You got a cold call. And back then, I, I just wasn't really, into it. builds character. It Absolutely. does. Absolutely. And so, Absolutely. humility. <laughs> so I cold, call, I cold called a wedding. I cold called a wedding chapel in Vegas. And – I, I did it and nothing happened because I, I just wasn't into it. And then I told Michael, I'm like, I can't do this. And that's when the, that's when the split happened where I'm like, okay, Michael, you do sales. I'm going to do operations. You did get Antiques Roadshow though. I did get – yeah, but I think they called me. No, called, you called them. Did I call them? I put them on your list. I, I yes, I think I think I did. But that's but leading up – yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that was a great account. We you still, want the show uh, that does 3 million miles a year. You know, yep. and and then what ended up happening was I went just deep into the operations, and then eventually we figured out that you should be on LinkedIn and you should start posting on LinkedIn. And the more I started posting on LinkedIn, um, I would cold email clients on LinkedIn. I'd message them, and the response has been amazing. Where I where like you zero in on somebody and you kind of create content based on what they're going to be looking for, and it's like a multi prong up attack and approach to try and zero in on them and i've gotten mega accounts mega accounts from right, did you do it right that's the advanced course most people just say oh hi God. you know no no no, 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 no. It, i want to mention very, also, very, very, i want to mention also i i'm not allowed to say what susan who put on air but yeah, no i wouldn't this woman susan has put on the top animated TV shows on air. When she told me, she goes, you made the right cold call because that's that's how our first conversation ended. She goes, you made the right cold call. She goes, we're going to get your career started. And I'm with her now so let, four let Jeff, years. I'll, let Jeff yeah, say I'll, his uh, his cold call story. No, no, he did the mission. president. The, no, he the, said the he has another He has another one. I have a, okay. The, 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 what I found works the best is you just start with a joke. 100% so, laughter comedy every time. So I, I know that I can say celebrities' names, right? If I don't do business sure. with them, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Snoop, Snoop, yeah, is flo I don't know if he still does, but back in the day when I was making this cold call, they said that he was the celebrity that flew more private planes than any other person. Sure. And through one of my friends, I tracked down the name and number of his manager who booked all his planes. That's I amazing. tried calling her. I would not leave a message because once you leave a message, you can't call back. Exactly. And they never call you back. Stalk this woman by trying, calling all different times of the day. Like I would call three, four times trying to figure out when I catch her at the desk. I was trying to figure out her schedule based on when she answered the phone. So I'm on the East Coast, there on the West Coast. I said, you know what? Let's see if she's an early riser. It was 9 a.m. in New York, 6 a.m. in LA. Now I call the number and I hear hello, like a gruff voice, just hello. So it's not an assistant or a secretary. Right. So I tell her, uh, how come Snoop carries an umbrella? She goes, what? I said, how come Snoop carries an umbrella? Were you planning he, that? Were you planning I, I, I that? Think, I think it just came to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. come Snoop carries an umbrella? She goes, what are you talking about? He doesn't carry an umbrella. I said, it's a joke. How come Snoop carries an umbrella? What, she goes, why? okay, funny guy. How come? I said, for drizzle. <laughs> now, now, now she stops. She goes, "That's pretty funny." Wait a minute, who is this? Yeah, I said, "My name is Jeffrey. I have a private jet company." And <laughs> click. <Love laughs> oh my she hung god! Up. But that's yeah. I, that's the longest phone call I ever had with her. So I, I guess I did something right. That's so great. That's I did fantastic. that with Pfizer too. I, I was trying to reach the woman at Pfizer forever. Pfizer has a big like a fleet of planes. Sure. Yep. And I figured, you know, it's called supplementary lift. Like when you have a fleet of planes, you know, like they have, let's say they have four planes, but it's a huge company. So they probably have one of four people that need to travel in a day. So when their planes either are in maintenance or unavailable on another trip, they need an additional plane, which is called supplementary lift. So I finally get this woman on the phone and I tell her, you know, I just realized me and you are in the same business. 
She goes, really, what business are you in? I said, I run a charter business. She goes, well, I'm Pfizer. How's that the same? I said, well, you make Viagra, and we both sell supplementary lift. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the lady burst out hysterical laughing. She said, you know, I thought I had heard every Viagra joke under the sun, but that one is brilliant. She That's said, who great. are you? I told her, she said, look, but like, you know, she said, listen, I would love to do business with you. I can, it's an insurance thing. And, sure. you know, you know, if we have, I said, what happens if you have more people flying? She goes, the low man on the totem pole gets bumped. And, you know, they work it out, but it's, you know, it's an insurance thing. We can't fly, but it's still, it got, it got me, you know, the information I needed. So it worked. It's amazing. Like this is, these are real conversations about real business. Like the, right. there's no fluff here and like we're real guys trying to make it and like michael has done that cold call to to pfizer that right. the, the, the same exact phone call to pfizer to meisner to to, to to across the board and i could only imagine what your call log looks like jeffrey where you know that's how you make it yeah, you, you can't exactly be afraid right. you can't be afraid to pick up the phone call and and make a joke it's not it's even amazing. the phone call i gotta tell you a real quick story we were at uh, gbta last year it was in chicago and there was a woman who was we were at this party we were sponsoring this party for uh, the BTN big shout out to Lou over at BTN and at Lindsay. At, uh, Lou and Lindsay and um they uh they they had this huge party it was travel manager of the year BLS was the sponsor and it was like our own private party in this like beauty and the beast type ball just ima imagine a barrel and put, and and apples or and, and fish and then you have a shotgun and right. you were literally that close that's that was the energy in the room it was we, like we it was were like the, the only yeah we were the, the convention only, was a waste the convention yeah, we, was an absolute waste of time nobody came to the booth except your current clients and then in you're in this room with everyone drinking and it's every travel manager in the industry right. and this woman walked by and i'm not gonna reveal who it is because it's a client now but she walked by i saw her tag and my son if you have to get that we can no, we can keep talking but we, um, I saw her walk by and I saw her tag and my son is obsessed with her product, mm -hmm. obsessed with her product. And I said to her, I said, I just got to tell you, my son loves your product. And I said, he has a collection since he's a little boy. He still has them. He collects them every year. And she goes, I've been to a million of these things and no one has ever said that to me. I'm like, by the way, I own a global car service. I would <laughs> love to work well, with you. And in that in that same room, I walked up to a woman who was a travel manager for a fast food corporation. And I said, I lost 80 pounds eating your hamburgers. Yeah. And she's like, <laughs> and she's like, that's awesome. Here's my business card. And yeah, you know, and we got and, it. And, 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 we, and we got it. And like, you know, it's, it's things like that that you have to be real if you're going to be that's a, a exactly right. if you're going to be a shoulder padded type of dude. Well, so that's what that and like so we yeah. had there was like a couple competitors in the room because they were they were there in the party whatever and like they were they're so bone dry they're so dinosaurs like they yeah. they 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 weren't getting it they were they were talking like you know we own a global corporate car service and like no one talks like that anymore like right. you want to be like English your product. I lost 80 pounds eating your hamburgers. I own a global car service. You have to try us out. And like, they're like, I'm interested. And sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes it's okay. it does. Right. That's exactly right. Like the Snoop call didn't work for you, but you know what? You still got into the White House. Yeah, so yeah. like the Snoop call worked. I got to talk to her and tell her who I was and what I did. She remembered me. It, exactly. Yeah. And exactly. you don't know where that's going to pay off in the long run. Exactly. You that's the first know step. You know, paths cross. It's a long road. You know, you can't, uh, this whole uh, sales is not an instant gratification thing. You kind of have to be patient with it. I got to tell you, Jeff, the, some of the best times in my life was cold calling. Yeah. No, no joke. It I was bu it was building character. It was it was exciting. You create, you create a shtick. You, cre yeah. you, you right. create. You have a bag of tricks and an arsenal that you can go in and you can talk about anything. And for the longest time, I didn't have that. And when I started getting into sales, I studied Michael. I studied my mom. I studied my Aunt Marilyn on what they were doing and you just you need, need a story you, you, need, you need a story a, you need a story it is. you know people forget that there's a person on the other side of the phone it's not a robot and it's not a piece of wood that's exactly so right so we, we, we digress so much in this podcast because yeah. like we love talking to our guests oh no that was like, a great that, that was, was a great, amazing that was a great segment yeah. i want to know so like did you just look at private aviation did you open the book you're like i'm going to start charters oh. like how did that work how did you so, start with private air so what happened was when the during you know when the first uh, tech bubble burst, obviously, I, my company burst with it, 
and there was a, uh, a wealthy individual in New York that I had gone to for investment that uh, had never really invested in my business, but he called me up one day. He said, I want you to come in. I want to talk to you. And he said that he had uh, tried to charter a plane. It was actually um, right after September 11th. He was traveling on business and he was a little nervous about getting onto a commercial flight. He's extremely wealthy and he tried chartering a private plane. Guy had nothing but money and he couldn't do it. He said, if I have my money out and I have, there's no one to take it, there's an opportunity here. At the time, the industry was very fractured and um, it was mostly uh, co charter companies that operated planes. There wasn't a whole lot of brokers back then. It was really only one or two. Right. And so That's the, yeah, so the, the, really the, the supply was in control because they just gave out prices. And if you didn't want to pay, then, you know, don't get out of the way because there's a guy behind you and there was no sales process. There was no explanation, you know, that the, the, like he, he tried flying, you know, from Las Vegas to New York and he got pricing anywhere from at the time 30,000 to 140,000. And he asked the guy that quoted him 140,000, how come this is 140,000? You know, I got a price of 30. And the guy said, well, this is what it costs. Do you want it or not? And it was a little frustrating. Mm -hmm. So we identified that there was an opportunity in helping people better understand the service because there was this misconception that, you know, if you want to fly from New York to Miami, it's going to cost you $100,000. Not if that's the price, at least why, but it doesn't really have to cost that. So we started, we started to, through brokerage, we started a brokerage company. And the model was, is that we were going to help people better understand private aviation. So where does pricing come from? Well, it's simple. You take the number of flight hours, each plane has a different rate, and you multiply the flight hours times the rate, mm -hmm. and then you add grant expenses. So if you're going to be there for two days, you have to pay for the pilot's room and board for two days. There's some landing fees, you know, some... Uh, parking fees, but that, that's pretty much where pricing comes from. And then where does the rate come from? Well, there's different size planes. This is small, medium, large, extra large. You know, this is how much an hour small is. This is how much medium is. And like, okay, we have 16 people who want a small plane. And then you get into, well, there's limitations, right? So you can't fit 16 people on a small plane. You can only fit up to seven. And we started walking people through this model of understanding what they were buying and why they were paying what they were paying. And it ended up being very successful. And so I was, uh, we started this business. I, I was partners with them for about a year and a half. We had some uh, partnership issues. And so I went out on my own, started up, you know, my business. And that's the company I have today. It's uh, Chief Executive Air. It's and amazing. It's, you know, we, it's been a long, long journey. We've had some, some ups and downs. You know, 2009, that's private business. aviation hit a wall. It, it, private aviation was vilified and it became a symbol that was everything. That was wrong in America. Sure. It was private jet space. It started with when the automakers went to Washington for subsidies, and one of the congressmen asked the chairman of, I think it was GM, how'd you get here? And he said, well, you mean I came by airplane. Did you come on the company plane? He said, yes. He said, you think you should be asking taxpayers for money and flying on a private jet, and people don't will never see a private jet, and you're asking them to bail out your company? And so a week later, he went back and they had a picture. I remember the picture of the New York Post on the cover was a picture of him in a Prius driving from Detroit to Washington, D.C. I'm like, oh, my God, this guy just killed me. <laughs> he killed my whole business. And it's like they used to run stories once a week, you know, through the fence at Teterboro. This guy's getting on a plane. He just laid off 500 people. This guy's getting on a private plane. He just sent out a letter. He lost $300 Look, million dollars for his investors last year. It, it was wrong. You know, I, it, it was. Of course, it, it was wrong. And I'm not. I'm not bashing your business. It was the same thing with us. You know, we were a limousine fleet up until like the early '90s. Like yeah. my parents had, our parents had limousines, right? right? Stretch limousines. And what was that in the '80s when it was it was gluttonous? It didn't look right. So then everyone moved to this corporate sedan, right? right? So, but yeah, no, it, it really it hits. It, it's all it's all about perception. Right. And when when people perceive that, you know, well, the rich people shouldn't be doing that because, you know, they just laid off 500 people. They're 100 percent right. right. They shouldn't be flying private and using car service. They should be taking care of those people that were that were fired as opposed to spending the money on that. Well, you know, I, I would argue that in the case of the CEO of GM, you know, his job is to manage and save his company. 
and it doesn't seem a uh, very good use of his time to have him spend two days on the road driving back and forth from Detroit to Washington D.C. Yeah, you know, that is true too. Thousand dollars. The, the guy, you know bu- I mean? the guy, the guy busted him. You know, like he he, yeah, he came no. to it and and he got busted and it was being filmed and everybody saw it and yeah, you know, it was good PR. It was yeah. good PR. Bad yeah. PR against travel. Exactly. You know, against private aviation, but exactly. But yes, no, you're hundred percent right. You know, the there's a reason why your service exists. There's a reason why our service yeah. exists. And yes, it is a luxury. It is expensive. Our service is expensive because it's one to one, right? Anytime you're, anytime one person is doing a service for another, especially when there's a vehicle involved, it gets it's it's not cheap. Right. And um, if you try and make that cheap, you're going to lose money, like Uber and Lyft and and all those companies. Right. So. Um, yeah, no, there, there is value. Flying, right. And, and there, there's tremendous value in flying private, especially. Um, did you ever hear of, um, Eric, what was that company that we were paying per seat? You don't do per seat, right? Jet, no, Jet, so the company uh, that does it is Jet Smarter. Jet yeah. Smarter, right. right. So what a, Jet what a Smarter, business. Right. So we actually, um, we do a lot of flight support for them. Okay. Because what, I, what, what we do now mostly is aircraft management. Okay. So the planes that I manage, we make available for charter, and we have a specific aircraft. It's a Gulfstream that we manage that's configured with 14 individual captain seats, mm-hmm. and they use it a lot for shuttle service, like a lot. We used that a lot two years ago when it was like 500. The membership was 10 grand. Right. And, then, and, and the then seats were free. Like, it was like five hundred dollars for free. Westchester it was, it was to amazing. Van Nuys it, on, yeah. for five hundred bucks. It was the yeah. best it was service. It was, it was amazing. And then the seats were a thousand, and then they were fifteen hundred, and then they were two thousand, and then we we're like, okay, you know, that's still a pretty good deal. Then all of a sudden they were thirty five hundred, and then all of a yeah. sudden they were four thousand. Then we're like, all right, yeah, no, it's back to Jeff. So that, that company blew through a couple of hundred million dollars of investor money. Yeah, and then went bust and was purchased by major Vista, international. Yeah, by VistaJet. Yeah. yeah, by VistaJet. So, do you charter now, or you strictly do um, jet management? Yeah, I still do charters. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's uh, when Eric and I, when Eric and I are ready to buy a plane, we're going to come to you, correct? Or we could do like, like I want my tail number to be MO, Eric. I don't know if you want your tail number to be EO, ending in like you know N five two six MO is my tail number. I like- I and Eric is a one o three EO. That's your birthday, my birthday. So we would buy a plane like through you, or yeah. okay. So the what what? Let's say you were seriously considering buying a plane. The first thing we would do is we would sit down and figure out uh, what your needs are. Your needs assessment. So how how what what's your typical mission profile? Where do you go from? Where do you go to? How many people travel? You know what's the most you could see number of people you could possibly see needing and the furthest you could possibly see traveling. Mm -hmm. And what we usually recommend is that if you're going to buy a plane, you should probably be flying about a hundred hours a year. And if you fly a hundred hours a year, that will give us an ample opportunity to charter the plane out when you're not using it. And that income will offset your cost. So, so how much does it offset? How much does it offset the cost? Like how much can a plane generate in revenue if you don't mind saying? Right. So I can. So let's say, let's say for example, like the way that I explain it is that let, let's take in, in the current market, we could use current dollars. So let's say, you know, you, you want a, a full size cabin. Jet. So the best full size cabin jet is a Challenger 604. Sure. I've sold five of them over the past two years. It's my favorite model. And the reason why, why I've sold why, them is- Yeah. Why, why is it your favorite? Because if you look at the economics of acquisition cost, operating cost, range and comfort and performance, it's the best. The, everything comes together in the way that's the best. It's a 10 passenger, full size cabin. The direct operating costs are relatively low. Other aircraft in that size class cost more to operate. And also in terms of the acquisition costs, you can buy one for a really good price. How much? Uh, right. For real, how much? How no, much I'm going to tell you. So the, the Challenger 604s were manufactured between 1996, 97, and 2006. Mm-hmm. We typically try and find planes at a year 2000 or newer, and that's driven by some consideration for charter because some of the jet card programs classify planes at a 2000 or newer at a higher rate. So we try and lock into the higher rate because we do a lot of charter support for some of the jet card services. So 
We'll typically look for a year 2000 later. Today, pre-COVID, you probably would have had to spend somewhere in the low to mid $4 million range. That's not but, bad. Okay. Buy a really nice, you know, 2000, 2001 year model plane. Mm-hmm. Today, you could buy that same plane for somewhere in the uh, low to mid $3 million. Wow, really? Same exact plane. So really? how, much does it co- how much does it cost to operate the plane? So, so the direct operating cost per flight hour, which includes fuel, maintenance reserves, and engine reserves, is around $2,800 an hour. The fixed expense, which includes pilots, insurance, hangar, management fees, right. fixed expense on that plane is probably around $60,000 a month. The charter rate on that plane is around $5,000 an hour. So wow. if you charter out 500 hours, a plane can typically do 600 hours a year without breaking too much of a sweat. Mm-hmm. You lose certain days to maintenance, you lose certain days because you don't have pilots, because one guy is sick and one guy's in training. So you never have 100% of the days of the year to dispatch a plane. You usually have about 250. So on a plane like a Challenger that has a longer range, you could pretty much do 600 hours. So we tell the owners, look, you fly 100, we're going to charter out 500. The 500 hours of charter should offset the $60,000 a month of fixed cost. Mm -hmm. So that when you fly as the owner, all it costs you is the direct operating cost, which is fuel engine reserves and maintenance reserves around around 2,800 an hour. Mm -hmm. The charter paid for your pilots, the charter paid for your insurance, paid for all your, you know, subscriptions, dues and subscriptions, Wi-Fi. You know, the the thing that gets people all bent out of shape on planes is how much the Wi-Fi service costs. It's like four thousand dollars a month, and people are like, "What do you mean? I, my cell phone's like free practically these days. How come it's four thousand a month?" I'm like, "Well, right, you're flying because that's the what air. they can charge, right? They're, like, there's only one or two guys that do it, and you know that that's the inexpensive service. That's a ground-based system that works off of cell towers. If you use a satellite system, it's about fifteen thousand a month. So, you know, that's these, really- these, these Eric, are things that we know how to manage. You know, Eric, Eric, you ready? You ready? You gonna?" Write the check. Let, I, uh, I, believe know, it. I, I wish I could tell you. I it's wish a, I could tell you it only hurts for a second, but it, it hurts a little bit every month after that. No, but but really, Eric and I believe in manifesting. We believe in the yeah. universe. We believe in putting things out there and you getting it. And that is an absolute. I, I believe in vision boards. I made yeah. a movie poster of my book because it's going to get made into a movie. I don't know when it's going to get made, but we right. believe in putting things out there. Because that's how the universe operates. If you think right. good and you you give good and you expect good, good will return. Hundred percent. That is out on our vision board, and it's not it's not gluttonous. It's not sloth. It's not greed. We we travel. Mm-hmm. We want to own a private plane, and you just sold us on the Challenger six hundred four. So we'll take <laughs> one. Okay, you could deliver it to my address. I'll email, I'll text you my address right after right. the show's over. And uh, uh, Eric will, Eric's going to be Eric's going to be paying for it. No, Michael, Farming, for you, Farmingdale for you, for, us. for you, we could probably even work out COD. COD, you that? don't have to pay in advance. We'll do cash on delivery. Cash on delivery, <laughs> fair enough. We'll bring fair it, enough. and then you can pay for it. I, I'm not kidding when I say this. I absolutely 100 percent want to own a plane at some point in my life. I'm 42 years old now. It's some. It's a. It's been a dream of mine. Um, I would use it for my family. I would charter it out. I would ha- you you know have the business people use it, and you know it really like I would use it like when my family would use it. We would pay for it. Like we right. want to. This has been something of a dream of Eric and mine. Eric, what? 15 years now. Easily, yeah. You know, once you, once you realize that it is actually attainable. And it's you know, also that, it's an incredible tool that you know, like people look at it as this extravagant luxury. And I can tell you, if you're flying on a light jet, the last word I'd use to describe that experience is luxury. Yeah, it is not luxury. The cabin height is like on a small jet. The cabin height is four and a half feet. Yeah. The width is four and a half feet. Some of them have a potty that's separated from the main cabin by a curtain. So you're trying to take care of business, and yep. everyone's like, "What are they doing in there? What number? Is say, it number one or two?" Up. The phenoms are pretty cool. The phenom those jets, are but those, those are the, those are really cool. Those are those are expensive because they're relatively newer models. You know, the, the right. thing is with that, like if you want to buy a new plane from the factory, they hate guys like me because I'm gonna cause trouble for them. So they won't go near any kind of aircraft dealer, aircraft sales, aircraft brokers. Mm-hmm. So we live in the world of pre-owned aircraft. Now you can buy literally a plane that's pre-owned only two years at a substantial discount to a new plane. 
But what we typically encourage people to do is to look at the pricing trend. And if you look at enough trend lines on values of aircraft, what you find is that planes will obviously lose the most value through the first five years of their life. And then prices will kind of stabilize for five years, the next five. And then after 10, it'll take another drop, which will last about a year or two. And then it'll sort of level out for the long haul. I have a fear. I just want to just say I have a tremendous fear of flying. I've always had. Uh, it's much better now. It's much better now that I don't have to fly anywhere. But right. it's much better now that uh, you know I I've kind of learned to meditate and I have my apps that show me where the turbulence is. Is flying private safer than commercial? Um, is it because I felt always very safe on a private plane when I was flying? So so the look. I mean, the, flying in general in an airplane is one of the safest things that you could do. Right. It doesn't matter if it's a commercial flight or a private plane. Okay. The fact is, is that the FAA and the industry do a tremendous job of keeping people safe. And there is, I don't care who you are, if you operate in the private aviation space, there is no compromise on safety. Right. So if flying commercial is absolutely and completely safe, how could flying private be safer? It can't, but it's also completely and absolutely safe. Okay. Tremendous. Everyone spends a tremendous amount of money, time, and resources making sure that the aircraft work properly, that the pilots are properly trained, that you know we avoid dangerous situations. The rules that we that pilots and mechanics follow are meant to sort of keep a gate around the limit of danger so that you never even get close to it. Right. And so in general, flying is a very, very safe thing. You know, people, it, it's, it's, it's like for me, the, the question shouldn't be if you, you know, safer, like you should feel completely safe no matter what. It's just about how you, what you're more comfortable mm -hmm. because that's a personal issue and it's not something that you can quantify. My comfort level is different than yours. So, you know, you're a nervous flyer. You know, I, I, I'm not a nervous flyer, but I have a problem in very tight spaces. So if I'm on a small plane that has a four and a half foot tall cabin, I would hyperventilate. I, I, I wouldn't fly on one. Cause... Personally, flying private for me is you you feel everything. For me, on a, on a plane, you feel it much more than you do on a, on a big commercial plane. And um, that's always, uh, you know, I, I didn't. I honestly didn't have a fear of flying or I didn't have anxiety about flying until I started flying with my kids. Then like kind of like my my life flashes before my eyes type thing when I'm taking yeah. them on, on a plane, but um you know <laughs> other than that I generally don't care. Look, I mean you know especially if you're on your own plane, you know you know the pilot, like you right. know him well, and you've flown with him, and you know how experienced he is, and that, that I think that's what gives people more comfort is that when they own a plane, they know more about the operation, so they have more confidence because. You know, if an owner says, listen, you know, spare no expense, make sure my plane is maintained properly and who's the pilot and, you know, like, you know, the people involved that are doing this and you have a higher level of confidence, it's not as random as getting on a commercial flight. So I think that's why people feel more comfortable on private planes because they feel like they know the operation better. You know, if you get on a United Airlines flight, who's the pilot? I mean, he'll get on at the beginning and introduce himself, but it's right, probably right. the only time you're going to hear his voice is on that plane. You'll never right. see him and you'll probably never see him again. I, I always question. go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. I have a question. So behind the, the Challenger six hundred four, what other planes are your favorite? So in, in that in that size class, that that's my favorite. You know, an, another thing that I love about a Challenger six hundred four is that if you went to the factory to Bombardier and you wanted to buy a Challenger six hundred fifty, which is the newer model, it's it went from the six hundred four to the six hundred five to the six hundred fifty. Mm -hmm. You bought a six hundred fifty, it's the same airframe. The only real difference is some avionics in the cockpit. And unless you plan to fly this plane yourself, it shouldn't matter a darn to you. It's a really? pilot. But the cabin is exactly the same. So you can take a 604 and spend about three or four hundred thousand dollars on the interior and put in a brand new 605 replica interior. Mm -hmm. And you can take it for 150000 dollars And when you get on this plane, you would swear. Run a Challenger 650, and those planes, new from the factory, are somewhere around twenty nine or thirty nine dollars. Wow! So, so you the, get the, the same the way, same performance, same cabin, same everything. So the way that it goes, it's like, um, isn't it like obviously the the billionaires are the ones buying the planes, and then the the, the corporations are buying the new planes, and then you go and then buy those planes from those buyers, right? So there's a there's a very active pre owned aircraft market. 
Uh -huh. And the reason is because the way that traditionally, the way that the tax code was structured is that if you bought a plane, if you only used it for personal use, which is operated, does FAA, FAA has different sections of the code based on how you operate a plane. If you're an owner and you operate the plane for yourself, it's owner operated, it's part 91. Charter, which is when you make a plane available for hire as an air taxi is part 135. So if you buy, if you, the way that the tax code was structured, which drove a lot of purchases and sales, because at the end of the day, tax is a big consideration for buying a plane because you get a tremendous, you know, non-cash expense, which you can use to offset the income. So that's part of the decision-making process that people use for buying a plane. So the, the old way that it worked was that if you bought a plane and used it for personal use, then you can depreciate the value of that plane over a five-year period. And it was on a modified accelerated cost recovery schedule or something like that. It's not a straight line for five years. It's like, you know, 20%, 25%, and then it drops to 16, 18. It's a set schedule. If you operated it for charter, you could write it off over the course of seven. So the tax code created this artificial ownership period of five years because after five years, you took most of your depreciation. And if you're using the depreciation to justify owning a plane, now you don't have depreciation anymore. What do you do? So people used to buy another plane. They used to upgrade, not pay tax when they sold the plane on the capital gain. They used to do a 1031 exchange, which is a like kind exchange. Mm -hmm. They moved their reduced basis to the new plane with a higher basis and they started depreciating. And then after five years, they used to do it again. So you have these big companies that have owned planes for years. And every five years, they do what they call a fleet modernization. They buy new planes, increase their, their cost basis, and this way they keep getting the depreciation, which helps offset some of their income, which helps making owning the plane make more sense. It's not just for travel, it's also a tax. Mm -hmm. What they did a couple of years ago was they changed the tax rules. So there's currently 100% bonus depreciation. If you buy a plane, you can take 100% depreciation of value of the plane in the year that you purchase it. There is no longer a like kind exchange. So basically the way that it works is that, let's say you buy a plane for $4 million. This year, it's, I'm not an accountant and this is not tax advice, but this is basically a layman's understanding of the way that it works. So everyone should talk to their own tax professional. Sure. Right? So let's say you bought a plane. If you structured it properly, you could take a $4 million write-off this year. And then in five years or four years or three years when you sold it, no one knows how that it's going to impact the, the sale because it used to be over five to seven years. And now you get it all up front. So when it comes time to sell that plane, you have to recapture the income. If you buy another plane, you get 100% depreciation again. So effectively, it's the same as the 1031 used to work. Where you pick up the value and you buy another plane and it's the same process all over again. You just don't know if the time schedule is going to change. That's and then it creates a loss that you can carry forward. Now, what, what as part of the CARES Act, through the end of the year, you can, claw, you can carry back the loss up to five years. So let's say you have a business that uses charters. And over the past five years, you've made money. And you decide, you're on here, I'm boring you. No, I don't know. I'm boring you. Going. you no, I love this. <laughs> late, late night last night. So you can, you can buy, if you have a company that uses aviation services and you can make a business case for owning a plane through the business, you can buy a plane for $4 million, take a $4 million expense, buy an amended return to previous years, and get a refund right away. You got to talk to our CFO. He's our uncle Kevin. He's he's the one that's going to determine what what we're, we're allowed to buy. Right I'm, now, we right now we're not business. buying anything. <laughs> nobody. Should. I mean, look, I, you know, it's not that nobody should, but unless you're in a business where you have certainty of sure. the future, or where your business is not a major driving force in your you know financial situation, you know, you, you shouldn't. Let me ask you a question. I see pictures behind you of a family. I'm assuming you have children. Yes, I have three. You have three kids. Yes. Are they um, boys, girls? I see a boy in the one. Two boys, two. two boys and a girl. Very nice. How? What are their ages? So my oldest is 22. What? Oh, my 22. God. My middle one is 17. Those are the boys. And my little girl is going to turn 14 in September. That's unbelievable. Congratulations. 
Anything are your children is this is this a family business do your kids want to be in the in the industry with you do you want them in the industry with you i mean eric and i we have a succession plan like we were our parents succession plan but are your children involved in your business so my my oldest son has no interest really i can't see my daughter being interested at all in anything remotely involved with working but she's only 13 so maybe that'll change right and my 17 year old i think quite honestly has plans to make a whole lot more money than i do so really? this is how much money I make doing this. I don't think he wants any part of it. <laughs> really? All right. <laughs> yeah, he That's thinks it's a shame because like the private aviation industry has such like an amazing, silky, sexy energy about it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So it's it, you it, are not insane. always. It, you know, it ebbs and flows, but um, hopefully we're going to be riding on a the new outside. Wave for a while. Yeah, on the outside. You know, like, oh, you low life. <laughs> Looking from the outside. I was walking through the street one day, and some lady asked me to sign a petition for the environment. And I just looked at her, and I started laughing. She goes, "Don't you care about the environment?" I'm like, "I don't know, lady. I own a private aviation company. We burn fuel for a living. Like, I think it would be a little hypocritical if I signed it." Right. <laughs> right. 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 Um, this was great. And and we I I have like a million more questions. I mean, we have a few more minutes, right, Eric? Yeah, yeah, we can we can go on. What, what, what's been inspiration to you? What books, people, like what has been a driving force for you to propel you in business to make you keep going? Yeah, do you so, have any mentor mentors or yeah, you know I, people you look up to? You know, it could be movies, books, you know, notable figures, people, you know, right. real, real life people that are that have been in your life. So I, I happened uh, last this past November. Uh, one of my friends had been after me for years to go to a Tony Robbins event. That's my guy. And I went to uh, Unleash the Power Within. That's where we went, Eric and I. Yep. And I walked on fire. You yep. did, and right? There, there was this this uh, personal issue that I was having that I just totally put down and left in Miami. And that was something that was very liberating. And it's something that I really enjoyed, and I feel like it, it changed my outlook on a lot of things. So that's yeah. definitely, it, I mean, it was only a, a short time ago, but I could definitely see a difference in you know, what I do and how I do it just from, from that time there. And it's not, you know, it's not specifically what he said. It's just the way that he teaches you to look at the world and look at yourself and see how you relate to the world and you know, what so, you're supposed to be doing. It was, it was great. So are you... Um... I, you, we obviously we connected on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, so are you are you big on LinkedIn? Like, what's your what's how, your what's social your, media what, presence? Yeah, what's your social media strategy like? Is do you have one? Right, right now it's very weak. One of one of the things that I'm especially uh, conscious of because I've been through it a million times in the car world is tire kickers. And so the problem is, is that with a with an acquisition of a plane, which is really what I focus on, it would take me so much time. To find out if someone was serious or not, that it's almost a liability to have too many inbound inquiries because we can't feel them all. And unless we know, you know who's real and who isn't, it gets really, really tough. So most of the business that we get is from referrals. It's from right. active clients and people that we do business with in the charter area. You know, the aircraft sales, we have a, a built in you know feeder for that business. People that fly, and every once in a while you see a guy flying a lot, and you call me and say, hey, Look, do you ever think about buying a plane? Because Based on how much you're flying, it may be something you want to consider, and that's sort of where the, you know, the acquisition management managed customers come from. But it's actually something that, um, for a couple of years, I was a little bit afraid of. But I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna finally get over it. And throw some Eric, let me tell you, Eric, do your dirty been, deeds, man. Yeah, say it's, it. It's been phenomenal for business, and you you wouldn't think that it is, yeah. um, especially where we 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 are B two B. To, you know that that's our business yeah. we are business transportation and, we do the and, same and, thing and, and we and we sell to businesses and creating brand long-term brand has been phenomenal i mean you know that's been it's it's been everything the past two years as far as when when you when you constantly post and i mean you have amazing content because you have private planes so you you know you can take a picture of a private plane every day and post and say on its yeah. way to on its way to miami on its way here you take the picture in miami or however it is that you would go and create that strategy but more more along the lines if you talk shop if you take what you were speaking about with us and you break that down for people and you educate them more um 
it's you know because like I learned stuff on this podcast. I learned things from you. I learned you know how what what you're doing. Learned how that, that it's, works. it is attainable. It is and attainable you, to buy right, a pl- private plane on this right, podcast. You know, like I didn't amazing. know. I didn't know a Challenger six hundred four was you can buy for three million dollars and change. Like that's that that's amazing. And if you educate people on that, it will reach the right audience. And yes, you may get more tire kickers, but in my opinion, it's worth it because you could find the diamonds in the rough. And uh, it just leads to more opportunities and stuff like that. You're a celebrity, you know, really and truly. Like I saw, I saw your Fox Business News interview. Like you, you have the personality. You, you create, call, create, you yeah, create a business avi- create a business right. aviation podcast. You called you us know. by our first names, right? I can't tell you. You know, people come on, they don't, you know, they don't even know who we are. But like, you reached out to us to be on this podcast. This, you, you have the personality, Jeff. You could be the face of jet charter sales or 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 air air private whatever it is sales, whatever, it, whatever is it is pick, whatever right. it is you pick to focus on where's your where's your girlfriend susie minkus what was her name susan grode susan, susan grode yes yeah. where's susan, susan grode, grode. <laughs> is she still around tell- yeah, yeah, she. Yeah. I, I, Sign my she, ass up, baby. Let her represent me. She, she. <laughs> I could definitely make an introduction if you need it. She represents my mom, who's written over eighty. Our mom, Erica, my yeah. mom, who's written over eighty children's books. She knows. She represents all the studios in Hollywood. This woman but is. She, she's introduced us to labor attorneys in her practice. You know, definitely, it's it's all about who you know. When yeah, she told 100%. she told me, she goes, "If you're stuck in customs in and, Switzerland, and, in Switzerland, and you can't get out," she's like, "Call me." She's like, "You want to buy a building in Nova Scotia?" She's like, "Call me." She's she's been an angel to our business, and like it, to to my personal writing career that has nothing to do with transportation. It's just a pastime that I've always loved to do since I was 15 years old. Um, she, I'm on this trajectory. That is that that she is. I call her the Illuminati, yeah, right? She she's it. the one behind the scenes, like pulling all the strings, like you know that you just you don't see her. She you know she, you can't find her online. She has a couple like interviews online, but she's so private. She's not in social media. Yeah. But if you want, I can introduce you. But um, uh, I'll, uh, I want to I want to keep you on um, what we're going to be ending in one minute. But where can people find you? By the way, Tony Robbins is my guy. I just want to oh. mention. Tony if, Robbins. You want to, if you want to educate yourself on how to post online, you have yeah. to study Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't Gary know if you v. know who Gary V. Uh, yeah, he, I know he's the, the guy. He he give he gives the playbook play by play on how you create content, on how you become an authority in your industry. And this this podcast is a product of what he said. Getting you on this podcast is a product of what he said. 100%. And then, and then, you know, as you build out, like the whole thing is like you have, let's say you make a 60 minute podcast, which this is, that means you have 60 one minute clips that you can go and post on social media and clip it up and subtitle it and go and post it out on LinkedIn. And it just creates long-term brand awareness. So yeah, that when you go, so when you go in for the kill, they, the person that you're contacting, they already feel like they know you. Right. And Gary that, V that, said that's the money shot. Gary V said if you're not doing if you're not on this your phone, if you're not on social media, you're going to be irrelevant. And that changed for me. Because and we would I have never have thought, we would have never have thought that because you know, why would a car service need to be on social media? Everybody is on social media. What's everyone doing in between the commercial breaks on TV? They're, they're on, on their phone. Media. What's everyone doing when they're on the toilet? They're on social media. And sure. if you're it's if, such a powerful if, tool. Yep. If you're it not is. on there, if you're not on there, being in front of their eyeballs, and you so. you're in a really cool business. So like, you know, you you should be. You have the personality. You have the cool business. I mean, like what Eric said, I'd be I posting mean, look, like every this. Day. The streaming platform. I don't even know how much it is, but it's it's twenty bucks a month for the service. Mm-hmm. You know, like there, there's there's literally there's no investment oh. involved other than time. Yeah. Yeah. Time. Time. I got. I, I, so. I where business set up in a way where it's I, I don't have to I'm not a slave to it for years I was, and I don't have to do that anymore. So where can people, Jeffrey? Where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? What's the name of your company? Where what website? Like, tell so it to the, the world. The company is Chief Executive Air. You can find me on LinkedIn under uh, Jeffrey Manager. That's a good good place to start. Uh, you can also email me. Uh, it's Jeffrey. Should I spell it out? Sure. Yeah, it's on there. It. It's your your name's going to be listed on there. Yeah. You could email me or then, you know, just call myself. It's 347-512-9596. 
when you want to yeah. buy an airplane, <laughs> buy rent. Or even charter, if, you have a question, or if, if anybody wants rent. to charter a plane. Yeah. yeah. Even if you just have a question, you know, it's, 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 you know, fortunately I don't have to walk around with my hand out all day. Like if someone needs some help and it's something that I know, it's my pleasure to help. You were a fascinating guest. This was Thank unbelievable. You. I hope you, I hope you would come on again in the near Absolutely. future. I had the best time. You had a good time. I hope oh, good. it's over. It went by so quick. Yeah, I mean, we generally like to give an hour. We we have some friends out in LA who are like, oh, we only want it 30 minutes. And it's like, uh, we, we, we want to talk to our guests. We want to give yeah. them an hour, you know, but like. Next this, time this we'll week. talk more about planes. I think this time we were yapping away about my history, which no one really well, cares about. But that, but that was great. I mean, that's, but you know, what that, that's, that's what builds character. That's what builds brand. And that's what, um, you believe it or not, that's what people want to hear. Good. Well, they, 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 they want to, they want to hear that story. You gave so, an earful. Thank you for coming on. Um, I'm gonna for having me. yeah hang hang out for, for hang out for two seconds. I'm gonna play the oh, outro and then, Eric. No, no, I'm still here. <laughs>